Shalom. And it was on the eighth day. These opening words of our Parsha, Shemini, refer to the first day of the month of Nisan, this very month, the month of Pesach, time of the Exodus, the going out from Egypt, the month of our redemption. Our sages teach us that this month, Nisan, was, and I quote, adorned with ten crowns because of this very day, the day being described here in this first verse of Parshat Shmini, the eighth day of the process of the inauguration of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the final day, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the first day of the month of Nisan, the Mishkan, the sanctuary in the desert, in the wilderness, was inaugurated. And the ten crowns, according to our sages, are, on that day, creation was complete. Nachshon, the prince of Judah, brought his offering. Aaron began his duties as high priest. The first communal offerings were brought. Fire came down from heaven to the altar. The portions of the offerings were eaten within the designated limits. The Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, dwelt amongst the people of Israel. The Kohanim blessed the people. It was henceforth forbidden to sacrifice on private altars. And this day was designated as Rosh Chodesh. And our sages teach us that numerous sections of the Torah were revealed on the first day of Nisan. So this day, Vayihi Biyam Hashmini, the eighth day, it was a powerful day, it is a powerful day. And God was given a place in this world with man, so to speak, as it were. And the very purpose of creation, which is for God to have a home in this earth, to be welcomed by man, was fulfilled. And therefore, creation was validated and the palpable joy of the universe was intense beyond description. And when a fire went forth from before Hashem and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fats, as it's written, small wonder that the people saw and sang glad song and fell upon their faces. And this expression by Aronu, people sang glad song, it's no other place in the Torah do we find this. This is the background of what happens next. An unusual, difficult, unfortunate story. The sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, react to this transcendent ecstasy of being, of being close to God, and of realizing the indisputable truth of the reality of His presence. They react as follows. Chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, we read, The sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, each took his fire pan, they put fire in them and placed incense upon it. And they brought before Hashem a strange fire that He had not commanded them. A fire came forth from before Hashem and consumed them, and they died before Hashem. So, their reaction to the joy they felt what they saw happening on this day, the true reality of God's presence amongst us, their reaction was to take fire pans, place fire and incense in them, and bring these offerings before God, these strange, unauthorized fires that He had not commanded them. And then a fire came forth from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died. Is this how their religious enthusiasm is rewarded? certainly difficult to understand. But we have to know that like all Torah teachings, we believe that this conveys intrinsically imperative eternal truths. So there is an idea here for us concerning what it means to serve God and what the temple service is all about. Tracing the idea of offerings from the very beginning of Torah, first time they appear, here is an interesting idea. Every time an offering is mentioned from the very beginning, the reference is also made to a rejected offering next to an accepted one. For example, Cain and Hevel, Cain versus Abel, Cain's rejected offering next to Abel's accepted one. And so too, when Shlomo HaMelech, when King Solomon dedicates the first temple, there are repeated warnings to him, such as we find in Kings 1, chapter 6, and verses 12 and 13, that he must be sure, be certain to follow Hashem's word. So this dichotomy itself informs us 
that the value of the temple and its offerings is dependent on faithful obedience to our duty to Hashem. So on the one hand, the death of these young Kohanim, these young priests who were killed by the fire of God on account of their illicit, albeit born of good intention, offerings at the very same moment that the fire of God had come down to express divine satisfaction with the offering of the people, and even more so to express with that fire its purpose was to proclaim the presence of God dwelling among the people, their death is like a statement to all who look at the offerings through the lens of their own subjectivity. That when it comes to the nation of Israel's service of God, there is no subjective choosing according to one's own ideas. Our sages look at these two verses that we read in the beginning of chapter 10 in Parshat Shmini, and they teach as follows. What does it mean, the sons of Aaron? I mean, the verse states, Nadav and Avihu were the sons of Aaron. Our sages look at, this, at these words, all the words in this verse, and they deduce some very important lessons from the nuances of the fact that these words are used. The sons of Aaron, you don't have to tell me that, we know who they are. This teaches us that they were his sons, and that kind of got to their heads. They didn't seek his counsel, they did not view the way the service had been taught and transmitted to them as necessarily having any validity. They each took their own pan, the verse says. They did not seek counsel with each other. There was no effort made to clarify whether or not this was the right thing to do. According to tradition, these nuances that are being deduced from these verses point out that these youths were behaving with a certain conceited vanity. Now mind you, they were very righteous. And there are many other ways of learning about this incident as well, but what we're, what we're dealing with here is an important concept because it would seem that self-importance had taken hold of their minds and they were the sons of Aaron but they did not consult with their father about their ideas or perhaps they thought that because they were his sons they were above all advice. They could only see doing it their way, for God, but their way. They were still only Nadav and Avihu. That's why their names are mentioned here. They were only individual members of the nation. They didn't seek advice from the leader of the nation, Moshe. And moreover, the verse says, Ish, each one, each one went his own way, in the way he thought best, and didn't even consult with each other. And their intention was praiseworthy. Even after their sin, God calls them those nearest to me, right? I will be sanctified amongst those nearest to me. In their joy, they saw this fire coming down from heaven, and in their love for Hashem and in their perception of God's love, they wanted to add love to love as the expression of the sages, but the very fact that at the, at the very moment when God's proximity to the nation was so wonderfully demonstrated, they felt the urge for a separate offering of their own. And this shows that they were not really filled with the true spirit of the Kohen, the Jewish priest, as it were. Because the Kohen has to be entirely one with and part and parcel of the nation. He's never separated from it. He's not serving in the temple as an individual. It's not about him and his fire pan and, and even if it's coming from great zeal and enthusiasm, it's not about his service of God at all. It's only within the nation that his office has any meaning before God. He doesn't represent himself, so their very approach suffered and was born from a misguided conception. And actually everything that they were doing was against the, the Torah law, the offering itself, the fire that they took, the fire pans, the incense, all of these things were against the Torah because, for example, the vessels had to be holy and they had to belong to the congregation because it's a communal offering, the incense. And when a Kohen brings his offering in a vessel that belongs to the nation, a temple vessel belonging to the nation, then the, the bringing, the act of that bringing his offering enters into the framework of the nation and he gives himself up, as it were, to Torah, to the nation, to the demands of Hashem himself, to the nation, the nation's needs, and to, that's to the exclusion of any decisions that he might be making according to his own ideas. But these firepans of Nadav and Avihu, the verse stresses, 
that each ish, each one himself, took machtehu, his own fire pan, and they approached God not with the vessels of the sanctuary, but with their own, without this aspect of self-renunciation. And the fire was from their own hearths, not from the altar. And what did they put in these fire pans? Of all things, ketorets. Ketoret is the incense offering. And the incense is the only components in the temple, it's the only thing brought as an offering that was never allowed to be brought as a nidava, as a free will offering. It was, all, it was brought daily by the, by the community, representing the community, and on Yom Kippur, by the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. But the ketoret, the incense, always represents the whole, the klal, the entire nation, unity. And the complete sublimation, as it were, to giving satisfaction to Hashem, a complete and perfect giving up of oneself. That's what the Torah is all about. But presented by oneself as a free-willed choice, as a nidava, for one person to, re to represent having attained this level would be actually very presumptuous. And an act of conceit, which is what they did. And again, the main thing that's stressed here in this section of the Torah is that this was something that Hashem did not command them. And we read this here, and it is so strong. When they brought this, Vayakrivu Lifne Hashem, they brought before Hashem, Esh Zara, a strange fire, Asher Lot Sivautam, that they were not commanded. And this, our sages teach us, actually teaches us that in the, in the Holy Temple, in the service, and, and by the way, we can learn from this, of our own service, in every aspect of our lives of serving Hashem, because, because the Holy Temple service is a template for everything that we do, but the point is, these words that Hashem did not command them, this teaches us that there is no place allowed in the whole service of the Temple for subjectively doing just what one thinks is right. Even the korbanot nidavot, even the free will offerings, have to be kept meticulously within the limits of the forms and kinds that are prescribed for them. Because, what's the concept of these offerings? Kirvat elokim, getting near to God. That's the purpose of every offering. And that can only be achieved by obeying God's will <laughs> and subordination to it. And as illustrated by the offerings in the temple and the mentality associated with them, Judaism and paganism are diametrically going in opposite directions. A pagan brings an offering attempting to make God subservient to his wishes, like, I'm bringing this so that you'll be good to me, etc. A Jew brings an offering because he wants to place himself in the service of his God. And thus, based on that understanding, we can also understand that any self-devised offering would be the opposite of this and would have the opposite effect because such an offering would destroy the very truths which the offerings are meant to impress upon those bringing them because such offerings, self-devised offerings based on my own decision of, of um, subjective reasoning, as in the case of Nadav and Aviyu, these would amount to nothing more than the glorification of one's own ideas, putting one's own ideas upon a pedestal, as it were, and the death of these fine youths. At the first moment of the consecration of the Mishkan, the tabernacle is a warning against approaching the service of God, which is, after all, designed to have a profound effect not on God, but on us, it's designed to affect a radical change within the conscience of a person, this, these deaths are a warning against approaching such service with subjective ideas of what's right. Because that would not be the service of God at all, but rather that would be self-service. Service of the self. Actually, this is not simple. We're dealing with an amazing insight, which has far-reaching consequences and applications because subjectivity is a major issue for all of us. Even those who attach themselves to God's Torah and seek to serve Him with all their hearts and souls and might, 
might still have a blind spot at which point their own level of cognitive dissonance rises to its peak. Less than two weeks ago, before Passover, the Temple Institute held a historic practice drill of the Passover offering. A three-minute film describing that event, available on YouTube, has already been seen, as of today, by over 60,000 people. Why was this practice held? The answer is simple. The Passover offering is called by the Torah, of course I referred to Exodus chapter 12, an eternal ordinance. Eternal means forever. Nothing about that has changed. No cancellation order was ever received. The Korban Pesach, the Passover offering, is not only obligatory upon all of Israel, but its significance is staggering because it conveys a message of obedience to God's Word and inherently repre it's representative of Israel's national identity and Israel's destiny to stand up and slaughter the false gods of this world, to challenge comfort zones and convention. And this brave stand against the world's idolatry is timeless. It still is a vital theme now as it was when Israel exited Egypt. It's the entire purpose of Passover, and moreover, this stand for truth is a gift that Israel gave the world. You know, we've received a lot of comments. We've, we've received many messages of blessing and messages of solidarity in the wake of this video, but we've also received messages of condemnation expressing great anger and hostility. Why did we have to slaughter an innocent animal? How cruel! We have been called barbaric, inhuman, savage, even Nazi. We have been told that we should be waiting for the Messiah's instructions as to whether or not to bring the Passover offering. Some have even said, you make me ashamed and embarrassed to be Jewish. You're scum. <laughs> You're not real Jews. And some have said, this must make God cry. This isn't Jewish. These are strong reactions indeed for footage depicting the attempt of sincere Jews to be ready to fulfill an eternal commandments. We've even been accused of desecrating the name of God. But the last time I looked, even the most perfunctory study of Torah informs us that desecration of God is caused by not fulfilling God's commandments, not by trying to fulfill them. And it's a fundamental principle that the Torah's eternal commandments are alive and well and not dependent on any messianic permission or reactivation. Great and illustrious rabbis throughout the ages, such as the famed Rabbi Akiva Eger and the Hatam Sofer, declared their support and urging for the renewal of the Passover offering. The Passover offering is obligatory both upon the entire community of Israel as well as upon every individual. And it can be offered today, even in our current state and under these current circumstances. All that's lacking to make this happen is the national resolve to fulfill this commandment, which, by the way, is on par and equal in its importance, according to Torah, with the commandment of circumcision. And what Jew would not circumcise his son? Indeed, the Passover offering can be likened to the national circumcision of the people of Israel. It's these two bloods, the blood of the circumcision and the blood of the Passover offering, which the prophet Ezekiel refers to in chapter 16 and verse 6 with these words, Then I passed you and saw you wallowing in your blood, and I said to you, In your blood you shall live. I said to you, In your blood you shall live. Now, perhaps people find this harsh reality check of a, of a film depicting the possibility of renewing the Passover offering, perhaps they find this as inconvenient, as too challenging for their comfort zone, for their lifestyle, for their subjective and selective decision of how they would like to believe that God would like us to serve Him, or how they would like to believe that Jews should act. And just as Nadav and Avihu fell victim to their own subjective reasoning which caused them to disregard God's instructions and bring their own offering. The same subjective and selective reasoning can be, and evidently is, used in our time for not bringing an offering, for deciding that this is not what God is interested in, this makes God cry, this can't be the real Judaism, even though the Torah emphatically declares that indeed it is, and that God commands us to fulfill it. 
I don't have to seek counsel. The way it has been transmitted doesn't necessarily mean anything anymore. I can be part of this nation, but I know what's best for it. I know what's best for it. And this can't be it because I find this abhorrence. Well, what's that drumstick doing on your Seder plate then? Maybe, just maybe, what some find abhorrent is the harsh realization that there is a little pagan still left in me, this self-importance that insists on being in charge, on having things my way, according to my definition and my way of looking at things. And maybe that's exactly what we are supposed to be slaughtering when we offer the Korban Pesach. And maybe Nadav and Avihu who, by the way, are considered to be tzaddikim, albeit misguided, they were righteous. Maybe they died to teach us that not only do we have no right to add according to our whims and needs, we also have no right to subtract from what God has given us as our eternal covenant with Him, claiming to speak for Him that He has changed His mind, finding His covenant inconvenient. This Passover offering isn't going away. The Torah isn't going away. And the one God of Israel is still waiting for His beloved Israel to get real with Him. It might not always be so convenient. But serving God in this world with our lives isn't about serving up our own ideas that make us comfortable. It's about God's eternal covenant. And as the Torah states in this week's Torah portion of Shemini, for I am Hashem your God, you are to sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy.